Stick around for the q and I'm going to co-moderate it with Richard Roper and this gentleman, James Ponsel. And don't move that. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, thank you everybody with the uh, Chicago Critics Film Festival. Uh, give them a hand. Yeah. It's such an honor um, yeah, to have been at the, the first, yeah. first uh, out of the movie go. Yeah. Uh, at the movie go. And you now the Music Box is just one of my favorite movie theaters in the world. I, this place is gorgeous beyond words. So it's just a real privilege to be here. And um, I'm excited to share the movie with you. And, to talk with you about it afterwards, and um, and along with Joan, and uh, yeah, see you in a bit. Thank you. So it's an amazing honor to introduce James Bonsold and Joan Cusack. Yeah. Let's start simple with how you both got involved. I know you were a big Wallace fan, so we'll start there and then talk about how Joan got involved too. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, put Yep. Yeah. Mm, hello. Here, you take this. <laughs> I'll figure it out. Yep. Um, yeah, and no, I was a big David Foster Wallace fan. I, um, I grew up in Athens, Georgia, um, which is a you know, college town, a big music town. I was writing for alt weeklies when I was in high school. Um, most of the people that wrote for it were grad students at the University of Georgia, and they were all obsessed with David Foster Wallace. Um, and I, I started college in the fall of 97, and Infinite Jazz had come out the year before. I was an English major. Everybody was either reading it or pretending to read it, or just bought it, <laughs> walking <laughs> around with it. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. You sort of had to, it was a prerequisite, right? And it was sort of, um, it was probably the, the most significant and complicated relationship of my time in college was <laughs> spending five months trying to read that book. I mean, being just beaten down by it, but really feeling like, um, like I've been in a very complicated romance, I guess. Um, and, uh, and then I got obsessed with Wallace and read everything I could get my hands on. And even when I got married, I had some of his writing read. And then um, years later, my former playwriting teacher from college, Donald Margulies, reached out and just said, hey, James, I don't know if you're a David Foster Wallace fan. Um, I don't know if you know this book by David Lipsky called, although of course you're not becoming yourself, but I've adapted it. And um, it would, I'd just love to hear what you think about it. And, wow really nervous because I just, um, you know, there's a lot of emotion for me in David Foster Wallace's writing and the script was stunningly beautiful um, and I got obsessed with it. I was very nervous about it because like all of David Foster Wallace's fans, I know, understand exactly how proprietary they are, exactly how articulate on Twitter they are and, <laughs> you know, the feelings that people have as they should, um, but I, you know, it was made with a lot of love and I, I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't not make it. And then... <laughs> Well, I actually worked with James on Shameless. He was a director on there. Yeah. And he was so nice. You can tell. I mean, this film has such heart in it. And he's such a good guy and, and talented and smart and passionate and knows a lot about film. And so when he said he was doing this and they were up in Grand Rapids, and I was like, sure, I'd be happy to be a part of it. And I didn't really know that much about it. David Foster Wallace, but it, it's so fun to understand him and to just learn about him, and um, it's such a moving story, I think. I've been a huge, I have a sister who's five years older than me, and um, I watched 16 Candles for the first time with her, and, um, and we watched it, we would watch it over and over and over and over. I never really, I didn't, when we worked together on channels, I didn't really nerd out. I think I did eventually ask you about the poodle skirt thing, and if you, how you did, but like, I was a big, huge, huge fan, and just loved working with you, and immediately was like, please come and be in this movie, please, 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 and you were really gracious and kind. I think he called you a unicorn at Ebert Fest, I'm not sure. <laughs> I believe that was the phrase. And by the way, if you people aren't watching Shameless, what is wrong with you? Yeah. Uh, Joan has created one of the most memorable characters oh. in modern television. I mean, just oh amazing God. work, year in and year out. Um, and it's a Chicago show! Yeah, it absolutely is. Chicago show. 
Uh, I want to I want to talk about, obviously about the film. And uh, as an Illinois State grad, why is everyone laughing so much at the Bloomington Normal jokes? Jeez, there's an extra layer there. Um, as someone who's been on book tours, I've written books that are 20% as big as Infinite Jest and sold 3% uh, as much. But I have been on those tours, and Joan perfectly captured that certain type of local publicist. I've been in, I went I've been Portland, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and it's it's the car is right. Everything is right. And like, did you base it on anything? How did you? How did, or was it, was no, it all in the writing? The script and the directing. Yeah, no, it was, it was right there. It was super fun. You've probably met a few of those. Yeah, publicists. oh yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those publicists. We're going to do How's It Hang in Topeka. Then we're going to talk to Crazy Ira and Jimmy in the morning show. And, yeah, those, those publicists are all out there, but Wallace is not. So how do you work with Jason to? Yeah. More of it there for a second. How do you work with Jason to find? The, it's not an impersonation, but it's a little bit capture the the bandana and the voice and the cadence. How do you? Does Jason come with a lot of that, or do you bring that? Um, I mean, I think we grew up, both brought a lot of uh, respect and fear at first, and then it was a uh, sense of all right, let's get to work and do the serious work that we absolutely have to do. I mean, we had a mutual desire to not do an impersonation. We didn't want to do the SNL version of David Foster Wallace, that would have been awful. Um, and there's better there's people out there that are better at doing impersonations, if that's what one wants. Um, but, um, y you know, there's a lot of, I mean, we had the tapes, there was that. I mean, so uh, Jason had David Lipsky as a great resource. The actual tapes were made available to me of the entire thing. I gave them to Jesse and Jason. Um, Jason and I um, spent time with people that were close to Wallace at that time who could sort of fill in the blanks and contextualize things for us. You know, if, if Lipsky flattered him and said, you're a good looking guy, how, how would, what would he have really thought that? Would he have bought into it? Things like that. To really understand the psychology of the character as opposed to just, wow. you know, there were people who could talk about the walk, the, how he carried his shoulders, how he shuffled, things like that. You know, uh, Jason worked with a dialect coach, a really great one, to get, to get that voice down as well as he could. But again, I think it was understanding. And Jason spent several months in Red Infinite Jest. I mean, he said he would say that that's he said he read it twice. Yeah, I mean, that was the most important thing for him. Um, right. He said is is really understanding how we're all the same. It's something that Jason has said, as opposed to just getting the voice. That but was the most important thing. It was that fine tuned. Like, how would David have responded to this thing that David said? Like that kind of detail in terms of those tapes. There's a, not a yeah. There's not a line in the movie that we don't that we didn't sort of pull really? apart and analyze. Again, we had the actual most of what's said in the movie was actually said. So there was that. It was a resource to hear and then get rid of. I mean, Jesse had done this before. He played Mark Zuckerberg. For a lot of people, he's synonymous with Mark Zuckerberg. And, you know, Jesse met David Lipsky and spent time with him. But, I mean, he, he already had a process for how to play a character. And a lot of it involved taking everything he needed to from that person, understanding him, but then creating a character, really being an artist and creating something. That was very important for him. This was the first time that Jason had done that. And he, he, he understood, though, he had enough friends that had done it that he knew that it wasn't just about doing an impersonation. One of the things I really liked about the film was the decision not to make a standard biopic or to just fixate on, obviously, the tragic end there. Because there's a lot of joy in this film, because David Foster Wallace was a man who obviously was deeply troubled, but loved life and had appreciation for a lot of things. And I thought that was an interesting choice just to make it more of a buddy road movie where it's as much as David's journey as David Foster Wallace's journey. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the people that maybe only have a peripheral awareness of David Foster Wallace, they know he wrote a big book that maybe you're supposed to read and he died tragically. So they assume he must have been a humorless and really sad guy, um, but he wasn't. He was probably the funniest writer of our era. Like, I mean, it, like all of you should go onto YouTube and watch. I would recommend this Charlie Rose interview from 1997, a year after this, which is a great frame of reference. I mean, you see him, he's charismatic, he's a flirt. He's, I mean, by the end of it, Charlie Rose is literally asking him to talk about movies that he's are spent, out there. Charlie's, he's spent, Charlie's literally, tell me what you think of Shine. Tell me what you think of English Patient. Yeah. And Dave Foster was like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Really? Uh, okay. He rips into him. Uh, but no, he was, you know, and by all accounts, when, when David Foster Wallace would go to New York and meet with his editors for Harper's or whatever, like, people would come out of the offices because they wanted to hang out with him and hear what he had to say about tennis, rap, food, porn, whatever. He was that guy. Men and women alike. David Foster Wallace also gave one of the great commencement speeches of all time called This is Water, if you get a chance. I think that's on YouTube as well, which is just amazing. Yeah. So was part of the purpose here to bring David Foster Wallace to a bigger audience? To, to you, you clearly were a fan. 
So did you think to yourself, this, I know I was talking to someone in the lobby who was like, I was coming to see this and I tried to get through Infinite Jest and I made like 250 pages in. But they're 250 pages in, so do you feel like this will bring it to a wider audience and was, was that part of your purpose? Well, that's tough. I mean, I, I can't, can't speak to that. I can say that if people really want to understand David Foster Wallace, they should buy his books. Um, you know, and start maybe with his essays even. I would recommend that. It's supposedly fun thing I'll never do again. Uh, consider the lobster. Um, that's the best way to understand you know, that man as he wished to reveal himself, you know, to, to the world. Um, uh, you know, I think part of, I, I have a real um, allergy to traditional biopics, cradle to grave stories that try to reduce a life to 105 minutes and draw some easy conclusion about them being bit by a spider when they were seven, that <laughs> predicts why they don't get a job when they're 40, whatever it is, it's, it's, it's um, yeah, it's, it, they feel dumbed down. For us, this was what, what I liked about this was, by its very nature, it's a subjective take about how David Lipsky was affected by his time with Wallace. Everything about this is subjective. There's no God's eye view of David Foster Wallace's life. There's so much that we don't know. We know exactly what David Lipsky knew. That's, that's, we don't claim anything better than that. That's, that might be small, but at least hopefully it's as honest as we could get it. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the tech stuff. Danny Elfman did the score. Danny Elfman rules. Talk a little bit about how that happened how it's kind of different for him. It's a really unique score. And some of your music choices in general. I was, remember seeing it at Sundance and I wrote down, oh my god, Murmur's playing in the background. <laughs> so talk about music and how it's important to this. Yeah, um, you know, um, R.E.M. and Brian Eno were frames of reference from very early on, especially in the song, uh, bless you, um, big, big ship that plays at the end of it um, from, from Another Green World. They're, right. they're, the guys actually did talk about it. I knew for a fact that was one of Wallace's favorite um, song. So you know he liked R.E.M. too? Like all that yeah, stuff. well they okay. actually did. I mean, while they were driving around, I mean, it was 96, so Monster was the R.E.M. album of the moment. Um, not my favorite R.E.M. album. But I mean, <laughs> Murmur is what the, uh, Wallace would have been listening to in college, you know, when he was at Amherst. Um, and, you know, they were listening to all kinds of, they were pretty democratic in what they were listening to, you know. They were music nerds, but there was also just corporate rock on, and yeah, from the 90s and 80s and 70s and 60s, as, as there is. Um, yeah, I mean, it was pretty early on. Uh, the assistant director that I've worked with on several movies now, his name's Nick Harvard, he's great. He, he was the idea on Whiplash as well, the film we mentioned earlier. Um, he, he randomly said, hey man, do you have a composer for the movie yet? And we, it was early in post. And I was talking to a couple people and, uh, and I was like, no, no, no one's locked in yet. I mean, I've got some ideas. And he's like, well, you know, I've got this family friend. Um, Pretty, pretty good. I don't know. I, I told him about this movie. He was like, what are you doing? You know, up in the Midwest. I told him about it. He just said he'd love to read the script and hear more about it. And he saw your last movie. And I was like, oh, who is it? He's like, Danny Elfman. I was like, oh, I've heard of him. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the, the honest answer, which I never said to Danny, was I didn't know what a composer was until Batman. Like, yeah, I, I, Batman was the first movie I ever bought. And I watched it every single day for about three months. <laughs> like, I could quote him verbatim. Um, and then got a, I mean, like, he is. You can't be alive. There's no one in this room for whom Danny Elfman's music, the Simpsons are all like, say. like the soundtrack of your like childhood is Danny Elfman in many ways. Like it or not, I like it. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, and he's done the past couple of years. I mean, he's worked on the last couple of David O. Russell films, the past few David uh, Gus Van Zandt films, and um, and they're more minimalist. Um, and this is even more minimal than that. It's great. And we just you know had conversations about instrumentation and. You know, he has access so often to the London Phil if he wants it, but I mean, I like things that are out of tune and broken a little bit and just sort of, um, it was very, I think there was a novelty to him um, for this. I mean, usually it's him being asked to do 100 minutes of score that's going to have explosions over it, or maybe it doesn't feel appreciated, whereas here it was 23 minutes of very intentional, specific score. He was a fantastic um, collaborator, he was generous, egoless, he got nervous when he was presenting cues to me at first, which I couldn't believe. Like, yeah. <laughs> there's no phoning it in, like he's, he really is just a true artist and just like I really, a dear, dear man. So uh, I, I read the actual uh, Lipsky book and there's a lot of moments in it where he tells him to turn off the tape recorder and it's sort of implied, and maybe it's just from reading like Wallace's like other biographies and stuff that like he's sort of leveling with him about like, hey, I was in a or whatever. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering how you sort of decided to treat those moments and like fill in the blanks and like what was your approach to that? Do you mean ellipses in general or as it pertains to um, AA as you said or? Um, just however you thought about it for the film and with 
Lipsky, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there is, yeah, there's a biography, for those that don't know, by D.T. Max called Every Love Story is a Ghost Story, which is a very traditional biography that, you know, in a very excruciating detail talks about every aspect of his life and mental health, things like that, and um, definitely read it, and I've read everything, so I was aware of that, but, you know, I, I really, um, didn't want to sensationalize anything. And I think what's important is that, I mean, David Foster Wallace, in addition to being a great fiction writer, was a phenomenal nonfiction writer as well. To my, for my money, wrote the definitive um, portrait of an athlete, bless you, of, 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 a, poli of, of a politician, this one of McCain, cruise ships, et cetera. Yeah, cruise ships. <laughs> but he knew, he knew exactly the games that Lipsky was playing and the pressures that he was under. And Wallace was very clear with him about what he wanted to share and what he didn't. He was definitely drawing lines in the sand, and Lipsky kept taking one step over. And uh, I think Wallace was really, you know, he was at the tail end of a press tour. He'd been talking about this book a lot, so he knew his talking points, um, which you probably, in a junket, you probably would have had 20 minutes. This was days and days and days. I think by the end of it, he was tired, and really just kind of saying to this guy, like, be a better guy. Come on, I know, I know what you feel. I, I was you. I know you think that if you have what I have, it's going to make that lonely, sad, hungry part in your gut not feel that way, but it's really not. Just be decent right now, and I'm trying to be honest with you in the way that I care to. Um, and, you know, I know you're like searching for poll quotes or whatever that are going to be there and get, get you the front page, but stop it. <laughs> like, in a very younger brother kind of way. So, try to be respectful. And But there is that tension, right? I mean, I, I see it as an unrequited platonic love story, and, um, you know, in some ways, like archetypally, I thought of like David Lipsky as one part, like Ratso Rizzo from Midnight Cowboy, and one part Salieri from Amadeus. Like, like that, that tape recorder, that tape recorder is a weapon. You know, it's or that think of that Heisenberg uncertainty principle thing. Like sure. these two guys in a different context might have been great friends, but that tape recorder and everything that it implies, it's just tough. They both need things from each other to yeah. a certain extent. And a little trivia: they, the actors were exactly the same age as David's were at the time. Yeah, Wallace was 34, and, and Lipsky was 30, and same age as the actors. Yeah. All right, thanks everyone. Real quick, I don't Thank think you. this fest would be here if James didn't come two years ago with Spectacular Now and yeah. close out. And so we are honored that he's back. So thank you. 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 Thank you.